Hi, my name is Paul Grogan. Welcome to episode 44 of the Gaming Rules podcast, where I talk about the games that I've been playing and various other things that I've been up to. Now, this time I'm joined by Matt Evans, who's going to be a co-host on the show, and I'm going to be talking to him about various things. I was also going to have Matt Leacock on the show, and I did actually do a podcast recording with Matt on Friday. Unfortunately, there was a slight technical issue with the recording, so we're going to have to reschedule that for next Friday, which means this podcast is just going to be me and Matt Evans, and I'm going to put the interview with Matt Leacock into the next podcast. As usual, thanks to everybody who's contributed to the BGG Guild and to the comments on YouTube. Thanks for all the entries we got for the competition. Uh, we'll be doing the draw later on. And also thanks again to GamesLaw, the UK's largest specialist games retailer at gameslaw.com. Right, so this time I'm joined by Matt Evans, who's a UK-based written reviewer who runs the website creakingshelves.com. Welcome to the show, Matt. Hi, Paul. A pleasure to be on. So before we go into things about games, just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your gaming history, and a little bit more about Creaking Shelves. Okay, well, I've been playing games for forever, but primarily uh, I started off as a miniatures tabletop you know, enthusiast brought in yeah. by you know, Games Workshop and Warhammer and all that. Uh, and that got me through my teens mostly because I was enthusiastic about painting. Um, so uh, the games, I look back now and see how much I really don't like Warhammer and <laughs> it's still <laughs> that much anymore. But it was but, a gateway into where you are now. Exactly, right, so... Eventually, I uh, I played a bit of Settlers Catan at uni, um, mm -hmm. but the price put me off until I discovered oh they do miniatures board games as well now, and right. so it was the miniatures that brought me in, um, and from there I discovered all the far more uh, clever, shall we say, Euro games um, yep. and things that don't need pieces of plastic to uh, let you have fun. Right. Um, <laughs> So when would you say that you you probably converted into a a Euro gamer if it's if it's fine to class that label on you? Um, I think that's that's fine. I I still enjoy uh, my miniatures heavy stuff as well, but yeah, yeah I think Euro game is definitely where I sit. Um, four or so years ago, I think. Okay, four or five years okay. ago, that kind of time period. Um, which happened to coincide when I started earning some more money so I could actually afford to start buying these things. Right. <laughs> so Creaking Shelves, when, when, yeah, when did that come about? Uh, that started two years ago. I decided I wanted to start writing about games. I find the whole idea about simulating the world with bits of cardboard and wood kind of inherently amusing. Um, so I wanted to try and bring that out in how I write about games. And have been having fun doing that ever since. Um, yeah. So I've got a good couple of hundred reviews up on the site. Well, articles on the site now, many of which are reviews. Yeah, so that's creakingshelves.com. That is creakingshelves.com, where everyone should be now clicking through to that site and having a quick look. <laughs> yeah. Or at least after this podcast is finished. Oh, naturally, yes. Uh, unless yes. they can multitask comfortably. Yeah. So, next thing is, is to talk about games that we've both been playing recently. What Paul has played. Now, I've literally just finished uh, our afternoon session of Gloomhaven, and this podcast would not be complete without me mentioning <laughs> Gloomhaven at, at least once. It's contractually obliged, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when I talked about it on the last show, one of the things that I said was, every scenario we have played now for the last three or four months. I mean, the last 10 or 12 scenarios, mm. we've come away from every single one and said, wow, that felt very, very different. So I went in today's, into today's session thinking, well, now that I've said that, you know, on the podcast, the next scenario we do is going to be relatively boring. It's going to be three or four rooms. It's going to be full of the same monsters we already know with a kill all enemies. And it's just going to be a routine scenario. Yep. Far from it. The one oh, we wow. played today was, again, very, very different to the point where we'd customized our decks beforehand and then we set the scenario up, read the goals and went, right, I'm completely changing my deck. <laughs> <laughs> I won't yep. go into too many details. No, no spoilers, for, right. for spoilers reason. But when we set the map up and people went, oh, and then we read the scenario and it was like, 
oh, right. Oh, OK. This is going to be very, very different. Um, yeah. and, and it was. And the other thing that happened today, two other things happened today. I played my my new character for the first time. So, Oh, of course. Yes, you've just retired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I re retired. So my, my Craghart retired last time. And I've just played my new character. Now, the new character that I've played, I'm not going to talk about too much mm. because it's one of the ones that we have unlocked. But it's the one with the with the music symbol on the box. Ooh. And I was looking okay. through it and I was like, this works in such a different way from the Craghart, I'm really going to struggle. And I did struggle. Right. Um, and it was it was quite tricky for the group to get used to the fact that yeah. the big tough fighter is is not there anymore. So how how are you getting on with your campaign? I uh, we're we're good. Um, so the last thing that happened for us again, no spoilers, is one of our char one of our characters just retired. Um, yeah, our spell weaver. Yeah, I think that's the name. Um, who had been pursuing her deity, um, trying to resurrect him, and finally oh, that one. we'd oh, yes. completed I that storyline. So that's an opening storyline. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can't. We definitely can't talk about how that storyline ends up. No. Um, so yes, that 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 happened. My my Inox brute is still just brutishly blundering his way through um, dungeons, mm -hmm. uh, smashing up whatever he can. Uh, he's still a long way from retiring, though. I'm I'm oh, okay. wondering if I'm going to hit level nine by the time he retires at this rate, because like, yeah. he levels up fast. Um, what level is he now? Uh, I think he's. Oh, I think, did I hit five? Yeah, Vicky's playing the spell weaver in our campaign. She's now level seven, and she thinks she's going to hit level nine before she retires. Oh, because wow. she's done... The, the, the particular personal quest she's got is to complete uh, a number of scenarios in a particular area of the world, and we have only had... I think we have the same objective. You've got the same one. Yeah. So I, I think that one, depending on which route you take through the campaign, I know that if we'd have mm. taken different choices, more scenarios mm. in that particular area would have unlocked, but we, we haven't. So, yeah, yeah, she's she's struggling with that. But I think she's she's accepted that and she's got used to the character and she probably doesn't want to retire it yet. But. Yeah, there's there's that part in, in me as well. It's like I, I look through, you know, every time you level up, you get a new card to add to your deck and I can't help but yeah. glance further through that pile of cards to all the ones that I can't let yet use and think, exactly, oh, yeah. I really want to use this card. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The other thing as well that happened, now this isn't really a spoiler, but because it, it's kind of mentioned in the rules and it's mentioned in my overview video, but you, you have the deck of cards, you have the road deck and you have the city deck and they start off mm. with the same 30 cards. So your 30 cards were the same as my 30 cards, but mm. that deck evolves as the campaign goes on. Yes. And one of the ways that it can evolve is when a character retires, you add a particular card to the deck. Yes. My character retired Last time, guess what city event we oh, had? No way, we found really? my character. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> Just can't stay away. So literally, the, this party of adventurers, the, the Crag Hearts left, yep. a new character's come in. They've gone off, they've done one adventure. Yep. They come back and they find the Crag Heart sat in the pub, all sad because he hasn't got oh, any no. friends anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, oh this is so just like his character because i always played the character as i've got no friends i'm on my own and nobody likes me and, um so that 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 was quite funny and that's actually the first card that we've had outside of the original yes. 30 cards that has been added in there because of choices that we yeah, made in, so that was quite in cool. my first that was quite my cool. very first game of it we uh our road event triggered you know us putting in a new card and I've been waiting for that card to come out mm -hmm. this entire time, and it still yes. hasn't. It's, <laughs> it's great to hear yeah. people. <laughs> and as I say, our first one has just done that. I'm so excited for when it does. So anyway, enough about Gloomhaven. What have you been? What have you been playing? Well, um, one of the games I've been playing a fair bit of recently is the Arkham Horror Living Card Game. Mm -hmm. Yep. Which um, a lot of people have, I think. Yes, it's been. Very popular uh, to the extent of it's very hard to get new copies of it. <laughs> so I've had the core game for a while, and I've played that you know plenty, and I reviewed it on the site a couple a couple of months ago. Um, and but I finally got my hands on the uh, Dunwich Legacy expansion, right? Um, which I've cr cracked it out, and I've played the first scenario of it, and oh, it's so good! <laughs> They're doing some very clever stuff with this with this game. So. Um, 
I guess for people who don't know, Arkham Horror Living Card Game is the fantasy flight system set in you know, the Lovecraft universe, the Arkham Horror universe. And whereas I feel like Arkham Horror, that series of games that Fantasy Flight put out, was kind of always felt, always been that kind of a merry trash, lots of dice, lots of randomness, mm-hmm. go in and spend four hours buried in crazy stuff happening to you. Um, the card game is just... I don't want to say masterpiece, but it's it's a masterpiece of kind of storytelling mm-hmm. and wonderfully done, and it's completely Eurofied, if that's an acceptable word to use. Okay, why would you say that? It doesn't feel like it's so. There is certainly randomness. You you still have resolution. Yeah. Rather than dice, you have this uh, bag of tokens, um, which is you every time you. Uh, face some test you're obviously you're looking to achieve some skill level um, and you reach into this deep dark bag and draw out a token and discover how badly things went for you Um, so there is still that in it but I feel like I don't know I I say Eurofy because it's so clever in how it uses its cards particularly Mm -hmm. the the game that you're playing against right the scenario cards uh so you know what you have is a, a set of just agenda cards and uh, which are the kind of negative half of the storyline that's progressing and you have the act cards which you're trying to move through and progress through and generally you do that by searching for clues around the locations you know i'm thinking about it it's really not very euro at all but it's it's just it, <laughs> this is why I questioned it. it. I said, yeah, I know, why. I know, but it's it. I don't feel like I'm at the mercy of what's happening. I feel like there's. Right. Uh, I almost feel like there is a malevolent force that's playing against me as I play this game. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's gotten to the point where the theme has been so well integrated into how uh, the has. gameplay progresses um, that it feels natural, almost terrifying at times. Right. Okay. There's certain events that have happened that have just like made me just sit back in shock. And again, you know, you don't want to say anything about what those are. No for spoilers. No. But I mean, that will. I I've played I've played quite a bit. Of this. So two of my friends have have got this game. Yeah. And I, I borrowed it off one of them, and I've played through uh, the base campaign that comes with the uh, with the core set. Mm. I played through that uh, twice. In completion, yep. and then I started the Dunwich Legacy, but I basically had to give the game back. And I thought, I tell you what, I'll come back to it once the Dunwich Legacy saga is, is completed. Mm. Um, now I've not really talked about this except to, to close friends, and I think, I, I mean, having played almost all of the LCGs that FFG have done, mm. uh, yeah, I'm sure there's one of them that I've not played, but yeah, I've played almost all of them. It uses the best parts from all of them. So it uses a uh, number of actions that you get in a turn, kind of Netrunner-esque mm-hmm. in a way. Obviously, you have resources that you pay for cards with, but that's pretty much every single card game yeah. you know that's ever been out. Uh, that's fine. It uses um, the sort of engagement with enemies combat system from the Warhammer Quest adventure card game, which was, that was, mm-hmm. that was cool, how yes. when you engage with an enemy, you put it near you, and another player can fight it, uh, or they they can take it off you and take it onto themselves. That's quite cool. The story element, the narrative-driven storyline, is fantastic. Um, I think you know for anybody yeah. who's, if we take Magic: The Gathering for example, or even Netrunner, where you've got your deck, I've got my deck, we turn up, we play, that's it. Yep. This is far from it. You've got that deck over there. You've got this deck over here. You've got <laughs> this deck. You've got another deck. It's more like a board game, but without the board and just lots and lots of cards. It uses the encounter deck system from Lord of the Rings card game, which mm-hmm. which was a cool idea. So at the start of the scenario, it will tell you, for this scenario, create your encounter deck using cards with this symbol on. So you go, yes. ah, right, right. So we go and get that one, we go and get that one, we go and get, you know, if you're in a forest, you add the spiders in, for example, yeah. things like that. And it is just great, and it's it's so thematic, and the way that it works is really really good, and I've played it quite a bit. Mm. Now, love it, highly rate it, say it's a masterpiece. It's still very random. Mm. Two two ways in which it's it's random, and I'm not saying it's a bad game at all, and I've thoroughly enjoyed every time I've played it. 
but the draws from the encounter deck can win or lose you games. You can get lucky with some cards, and the, the, the cards can come out in the right order and you, you can be really lucky, uh, and you can get cards that just come out in the wrong order and it's the wrong ones that you need at the wrong time. You've no real control over that, that's just how it works. Does it tell a good story? Yes, absolutely. The draws from the bag, which you've mentioned, again, it, it, that, that's random. You know, it, it's similar to my philosophy on you make a decision and then you roll dice to see whether it works or not. In this, you yeah. draw an encounter out of the bag. Now you can, one, one thing that's cool about the game is that the cards that are in your hand, there's two uses. You can either use them for the card itself or the certain icons on the card which you can play before you're making a particular skill test in order to increase the chance of success. So if you're fighting something, that's going to be a, uh, a strength check or whatever it's called. And if you were to throw away this card with two strength icons on, it gives you plus two in that test, which is nice. But then you're still at the mercy of drawing the, the token out of the bag. So yeah, there's always that red token in there that is an auto red fail. one in there. Yeah. So I was playing um, scenario three of the core game and I got to the final fight mm -hmm. and the final thing that I needed to do and I threw cards away as many as I could from my hand to give my net modifier a plus two. Right. Now I was playing on the easy setting and when you're playing on the easy setting, that bag is filled with a few plus ones, some zeros, <laughs> some minus ones, some minus twos. Yes. And there was one in there that's an automatic fail and I drew the automatic <laughs> fail. So that, that's it, scenario over. That, the chance of that happening was fine. Yeah. And to be honest, I, d I didn't bother it because I enjoyed the story yeah. um, and I, I, I really enjoyed it. Now, one very, very cool thing about the game is that, and you need to know this when you start playing it, is that it isn't just succeed or fail. If you fail, and I'm, I'm doing quotes here, even though you can't see me doing quotes, I'm doing quotes. If you fail scenario one, you just read a different ending and then you progress to scenario two. Mm. So it's not like you play it, you fail, you go back and do it again. You play it, you, you reach a certain point, and you, you're not going to succeed in the scenario. So there is a way out, and then that leads to a different part of the story. So the way that those first three scenarios resolve and, and what happens in them, it, it tells a story all on its own, and it's yeah. only over until the third scenario is over. So Yeah, I think that's very clever of them to put in these branching routes through each yes. scenario. I mean, it's a story-driven game, but it's in it's very, very replayable. Yeah. Now, I've played that that first scenario, yeah, three, three times now, I think, or even four times, that first scenario. Mm. So I'm not going to have any surprise when I play that first scenario. I know what's in that room when I go to that room, and it's more about you know, working it out. And, and as I mentioned, the randomness of the cards that come out of the encounter deck means that every game is going to mm. be resolved in a different way. So the more you play it, the more you'll have an idea of what you need to do and you'll get better at it. But yes, Arkham Horror Living Card Game, we've probably gone on about this enough, but yep. it's, it's, it's really good, it's really <laughs> enjoyable. Yep. So another game I've been playing, well, another game that I played on Friday night actually was a game called uh, Ascended Kings. Now this game is not out yet. I was contacted by a publisher in America, Incarnate Games, who haven't done any game before, to work on their rulebook. Right. This is back in January, I think. So I did the rulebook, and like a lot of the rulebooks that I edit, I don't see the game, I don't get a chance to play the game, I just read through the rules and I try to make them clear as best I can. Right, so you ask the questions that you would be asking if you... Yeah, if I was actually playing box. it. Yeah. And, and the rulebook needed a lot of work, it needed massive amounts of editing, restructuring. Mm. It was a huge amount of work. Now, I never feel comfortable when once I've done that until somebody's actually gone through it and blind tested it. So I, I offered to the publisher, I said, look, I, I can offer you a blind playtesting service because I've got various friends who can help me do that kind of thing. I basically buy them all pizza and a bottle of wine. They come <laughs> around, they give up their time. They read the rule book that I've written and then they play the game with me watching sitting there in silence. Yep. And this, this is the important thing with the blind playtest session is that the people who are playing it have no prior knowledge of the game whatsoever, mm. but the person who wants it blind playtested has to be there, because for all I know, I could have given it to them. They could have said, yeah, yeah, we played it. It all went fine. We understood the rules. And they might have been playing it completely wrong, for yes. all I know. So I, I've got to be there in the room when they're doing it. But what we did on Friday is we went one step further. I thought, well, I want to play this game. 
So I sat there at the table and they got the rule book and they sat there with the rule book and they read through it and they were teaching me and they taught me how to play the game that I'd read the rule book for. And I okay. was trying to pretend that I didn't know any of the rules whatsoever. And I was like, but what happens if this? You know, and that's a question I would have asked anyway. And they went, oh, I'm not sure. Oh, wait a minute. It, it, that's in the rule book. It, it is in there. Now, some of those I did know were in the rule book, but you know, <laughs> it was January. I, I've forgotten a lot. <laughs> so that was an interesting experience. I, I, I don't really want to comment on how the game played because, you know, I'm involved in it and they're a client of mine. And, it, and it's not out yet. Yep. It's not out yet. Um, it's going on Kickstarter later on this year. But it, it was interesting to, to do the, the playtest session yeah. and you know, the people I play with seem to enjoy it. So Would um, you do it that way again? I would. But it's because I, I wanted to play it as a four-player game and there were three other people who wanted to play it. Mm. Otherwise, what I would have done is I would have just sat there quietly. But actually, now having done it, I would probably do that again because then I got to play the game. I got to experience <laughs> it. But I got to act dumb so uh, anyway back to you what else have you been playing well um game i've been playing recently i just got in a review copy of it is yamatai which is mm -hmm. the very pretty new release from days of wonder a lot of people are talking about this yes well uh, they only release one big game a year so it's usually a yeah. talking point and everyone kind of looks forward to it it's very nice you know i've okay. only played it twice so far review will be out in some time, once I managed to get it played another couple of times. Um, it's obviously so... I mean, you can't talk about it without saying how beautiful it is. Um, mm -hmm. It does look nice. Yes, it's a shame about podcasts, isn't it? You can't show that. Well, I'll be putting but, pictures. What, in, oh, in the YouTube in the video, version of yes. this podcast, I'll, I'll put some pictures on screen so people can see it. Excellent. So, Yamatai, you've got this big chain of islands um, in somewhere around Japan and... As you do, you're trying to uh, impress the queen by spreading yourself across it and building things, um, much as you do in board games generally. Um, and it's a very much it's a very spatial puzzle style of game. So you have the you can place boats out uh, between the islands on little spaces, um, and that lets you either pick up tokens to clear the islands, and those tokens can let you hire people, which are worth points and special powers, etc. Um, or you can build on islands that have already been cleared if those islands have a certain combination of boats around them. So you have this interesting interplay where um, no one can build anything at the start because everything's okay. covered in um, these culture tokens. And so... You need to, someone has to go out and remove those culture tokens, but as they do that, they leave space behind for everyone else to build. Okay. So you have this, yeah, it's an unusual experience where certain elements of the game seem to try to, it's like you don't want to build certain things but it, because it gives everyone else the opportunity to do stuff, but then you doing those things are actually really good for you. Right. So taking those culture tokens gives, lets you, um, I don't know, impress, I suppose, the special character cards that you can hire. Um, they, they love your culture. Uh, you're so okay. cultured, right? Um, <laughs> and so then when they come along and join you, you, they're worth some points, but they also give you some special power that you can use throughout the rest of the game. Right. Which can be really nice. You can get some actually quite interesting combos out of that if you play it well. Okay. And then on the building side, you're trying to build in. You're trying to build your buildings on adjacent islands, and you can get some quite uh, aggressive um, building, uh, as it were. As well, at least I do. Uh, go around cutting everyone else off right. as much as possible. <laughs> okay, so are we talking two to four players, ninety minutes? It's it's that kind of thing. Ballpark, yes. Yeah. Um, for people who've played Five Tribes, it's. Yep. Not the same, but I think it has a lot of similarities in okay. style. So I'll hate it then. Probably, if you hate if you hate Five Tribes, I think <laughs> there might be a, you might have similar issues with this. Five Tribes is not a bad game. It's just not for me. I, I can't That's look at a thing, board right? and see 
you know, a hundred different options and then go through each one and work out which one. So this yeah, is it's... kind of, it starts, rather than five tribes, which starts off full of little wooden colourful things yeah. and empties, this one starts off empty and gets filled with little wooden oh, colourful things. That, that might be fine. <laughs> that might be okay then. But you have the similar thing of trying to look and find the right spatial trick that you can pull. Yeah. Um, which can lead to some people. There is there is a similar kind of a you know AP analysis paralysis problem. Um, right. So it's pick the right people to play with. And as you say, you've got a review of this coming out in the next couple of weeks. Couple of weeks, yes. Yeah. So watch this space for a, a full exactly. review of of Yamatai. So uh, right, well that that's that's enough about the games that we've been playing. Um, last podcast I talked about something interesting, which is what Games Workshop are, are suddenly changing doing a 180 degree turn and changing their policy and what they're going to be doing was there anything that's caught your eye that's been happening in the games sort of industry over the last couple of weeks that you wanted to talk about yeah so there's been something interesting happening over on the crowdfunding side of things okay tasty minstrel games currently has a project for flow of history which mm -hmm. you did a I know about that. rules video, I did the video about for it. yes indeed um and they initially started off that crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo. Yeah, which was different because I think they normally use Kickstarter. They do, yes. Um, and indeed, most of the hobby board game stuff is on Kickstarter. So yeah, going to Indiegogo seems like quite a you know unusual step, unexpected yeah. step. Um, they then cancelled that campaign um, and have relaunched back on Kickstarter. Right. Where they're now doing, uh, I think they've, I think they've raised twice as much as they had, you know, um, on Indiegogo within. Because it had funded time. on Indiegogo, hadn't it? It was successful. It had just funded, yes. So they just reached. I think they were looking for twenty thousand dollars, and I think it was on about twenty five or something. Right, but it's now on fifty on um, Kickstarter. It's now sixty on Kickstarter. Right. Okay. Um, so you can immediately you can immediately kind of see why <laughs> this was definitely yeah. the, the right decision for Tasty Minstrel Games. But it's interesting as to why they decided. Now, Tasty Minstrel Games are a client of mine. Mm, I yes. really don't know anything about this apart from apart from what's been uh, put out in the public. But when I got the Tasty Minstrel newsletter, it said mm. uh, we have listened to our fans. So yes. I, but it, so it appears that they they did it because a lot of their fans said, oh, why aren't you using Kickstarter or something? Now, for me, I don't really know the difference between Indiegogo and Kickstarter. They're both crowdfunding platforms. Mm -hmm. You pay your money, you get it later on. I, 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 obviously, there are differences to how they work, but I, yeah, I don't Yeah, there are a couple that. of subtleties, but yes, fundamentally, um, they're supposed to be doing the same job, but it's, it's pretty clear that in the board game industry, everyone is just used to Kickstarter. Yeah. Um, and there is there is a big kind of, you know, step in having to sign up to a new site and mm -hmm. do, you know, in order to back something, even if you want to, right? If you've never backed something on Indiegogo, but you've, you know, even if you're a regular Kickstarter backer, right? At least for me, and maybe maybe this is me, and I'm too old fashioned. I I hate signing up to new websites. Right. Right. That's a that's a hurdle, and you don't want to put up hurdles to your okay audience. Um, they've been able to now they're able to make it a far swisher package with the um, the increased funding now. Yeah. So flow of history um, for anybody who hasn't seen my video, go and watch the video. No, it's um, <laughs> it, it's a light to medium civilization style card game. Plays up to five players. Plays in about an hour. It's by Jesse Lee, who's done a couple of other games, and it's got an interesting mechanism that I've never seen before in a game. I've played it a few times and quite like it. So Nice. Yeah, go and have a look at that if you're interested in, in that kind of thing. So what have we both been up to um, in the last couple of weeks? Well, I've been up to renovating my games room, and for those of you who haven't seen it, I've released a video uh, on me versus the Kallax shelves. Now, <laughs> the plan was that I would do a video of... Here's my gaming room. Here's how it looks. It looks a complete mess. I've bought some shelves, and here's how it looks now that I've put the shelves in. That was the idea of the video, but yep. halfway through the video, there's me with a video camera going, oh, that, that looks a bit 
bigger than I thought. The other one's gonna fit there, I hope. And then I stopped recording the video and I got out the measuring tape and went, oh no, it's actually not gonna fit. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I basically measured it incorrectly by 30 centimeters. Oh, I mean, you know, not just yep. a little bit. I'd measured it incorrectly by 30 centimeters. So yep. when I went to Ikea and, and bought these two Kallax shelves, I thought, that's fine. I'll put the two Kallax shelves next to each other There'll be about 15 to 20 centimeters of gap at the edge. Yep. And that's where I'm going to put all of my rolled up fabric that I use for filming the videos. I'll put all that there. Yep. But as you will see live on camera, <laughs> that, that, that didn't work out. So there was much, uh, much frustration, much umming and ahhing about what to do. And then yep. the saw came out. And this is my biggest regret on the video is about two thirds of the way through, there should have been a montage <laughs> of me cutting the shells because I got I got I did all the cutting and then put it all back together and the end result looks fantastic. So well done. It's all good. Yes. Um, it, it looks fine. So is that a full square have to be taken off? Was it? Mm, I basically cut uh, five centimeters off one of the edges. Right. So uh, yeah, what I'm saying is. I mismeasured it by 30 centimetres, but I would have had 25 centimetres spare. So actually oh. I was only short by five centimetres. So I Good. basically had to cut. So <laughs> one of the five by five units is missing its side. Okay. And then I had to cut another uh, 20 mil off. Yep. And uh, yeah, you'll see in the video how, how, how I've done that. But that's done, that's in. All of the games have gone in and I've used it as an opportunity to basically take out about a dozen games that I think, look, I'm never gonna play this again. I'm gonna take it to the expo, stick it in the bring and buy. Yep. Games that I'm, I'm not keen on, or games that I'm just never gonna play. I've got Game of Thrones, the board game, first edition. Mm, first well, edition, gonna, Yeah, I'm never gonna play that again. It's just sat there, do I keep it? Do I use the bits for other games, or do I put it in the bring and buy for a tenner and see if it goes, I don't know. Yep. I've had my own shelf emptying process just today. What have you been doing with your shelf emptying process? Yeah, well, as a reviewer, I, I'm lucky enough to get sent games on a fairly regular basis, mm -hmm. which means uh, it's I have to get on, you know, keep it under control. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a forgiving girlfriend, um, but that forgiveness only goes so far, and I've had piles of games building up in the living room now uh, for the last few months. Yep. Um, so it was it was time to finally take rearrange my shelves and figure out which ones you know i love and really want to keep playing and which ones i can afford to kind of put to one side and find a good home for somewhere yep so what method did you use because a lot of people use the one in one out method that i don't that's, think i could ever do that's a very sensible very wise method yep. um no i i did a right you know like i say i let it build up and then i just do a big go through everything and look at each game and say, do I want to keep playing this game? Yes, right, okay, put it in, put it on a shelf. Uh, could I could I cope with not having this game? Which is so hard, but yeah, you have to do it. And okay, put it off to one side and I'm gonna figure out some way. I know there's a, um, as, uh, there's a guy at uh, the UK Games Expo who will be doing um, an auction. Mm -hmm. selling off games. I, last year I gave some of my old review copies to him to sell off for charity. Yep. Um, so I'm going to get in contact with him and hopefully uh, do similar. This is Elliot, is it? Elliot, yes, yep. that's right. I know, I know Elliot. So he's the auctioneer, um, mm -hmm. orc, as in ORC, auctioneer. Yes. Um, he does and a yeah, very he's entertaining he's, auction. Yes, so he's doing the charity <laughs> auction. I'm, I'm with my CGE hat on. Um, I'm giving him some CGE games for him to, uh, oh, great. to for him to give away. But yeah, if you've got a review yep. copy of a game which you've played a couple of times and it's as good as new, great. Yeah, I don't think yeah, I'm going to gi be giving him my Game of Thrones first edition board game from 15 years ago. <laughs> I <don't, laughs> yeah, <I'd>, well, <laughs> I could sign it by Vlaja because I, I, I do that quite a lot, you know, just to <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> to Paul with love. <laughs> yes, from Vlad, yeah. yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, you wanted to talk about combining more than one game into a single box. I did, yeah. And it's so, interesting, because I'll let you talk about it first, then I've got my own thoughts on that. Yeah, so in order to um, squeeze a few more games out of the very limited shelf space that I'm permitted, I um, made the decision that... So I'd already, by accident, kind 
to have combined two games already um, in order to take both of them to a game yeah. day when I just had one backpack. And so they're already together. And I thought, these are two games with massive, you know, which normally have massive inserts and tons of board game space available mm-hmm. inside them. You know, not very many components. So, like, maybe I can just leave them together and I could probably fit another one in here. And so I, I did, I, I decided right i'll just do it so i've i've combined um costa rica capital um and i think fields of green uh okay which are three games no so there's no logic to the right. theming it's just here. they fit it's just <laughs> they they fit yeah I, i've got a lot of space in the fields of green box <laughs> but what it's box the are prettiest they in? box they're in the fields of green box and what about the other two the one, boxes they are going in the bin oh. <laughs> and capitals are really pretty box as well. Will they not fit in so that much. box? They could, uh, but capitals an awkward shape. Okay, it's a really strangely thick and kind of squat square, right? Um, which just doesn't fit on the shelves okay. as easily. So here's what I've done. I've yep. done something similar, and I think for Ooh, me, well done. It started by accident as well, for exactly yep. the same reasons as you. But what I've done is the a Starry Games range of games. When Starry Games started making games, I bought all of them. So um, they right. came out with East, Kalos, East Pahan, uh, Assyria, the Hanging Gardens one. I can't remember. Anyway, I bought loads of them. Yep. And like a lot of board games, there's plenty of space in the box. So I combined I, basically two of them together into one. Mm-hmm. And with the boxes, I used the front of one box and the back of another box because they're all the same size. Oh, which makes nice. perfect sense to me, but everybody else is completely <laughs> confused because they pick up the box off the shelf. You know, I, I, I host games days and games evenings here, and basically the games room is open. People can come in, pick a game off the shelf, and play it. But they oh, don't. Nice. They don't know yep. my system, so they pick up a Syria off the off the shelf, turn it over, and they're going, "Wait a minute, this is the what?" And they flip it over, and then they flip it back, and they're like, <laughs> "What's going on here?" And it's because it's a Syria on the front and Amiitis on the back. I know that, and inside <laughs> are bits from both games. So yes. it kind of works, but you've got to have a, a method. Mm-hmm. And now I've still got my other bo- other half of those boxes because I've got an attic. So I don't like throwing things away. So <laughs> I've got an attic full of empty boxes where I have done that. Yes, some of us um, are lucky enough it, to have attics. <laughs> yeah, it's something that I might consider doing more yeah. of I feel in like future. You need to be careful, right? Because... I know that Fields of Green has a few games in it. That's cool. If mm-hmm. I start doing this a lot... You need to remember. Um, it's going to get very yeah. confusing, isn't it? Un- unless you you modify the front covers of the boxes. Yes. So scan in the front cover of Capital, scan in the front cover of the other game yep. that you just mentioned. Costa Rica. Yep. Costa Rica. And then do a mashup front cover <laughs> ah. with three vertical strips, like the front cover of the Unlock sure, box, yes. with basically the three games on there. And... Do the same with the back, and that's and there you a go. very nice idea. I like that. <laughs> it might work. It might work. So, um, in terms of a question for the guild, so every every podcast, I like to ask a question of the guild and get responses on there. I'd like to know if anybody else has done this. Obviously, everybody's got their own ideas about how to keep their collection low, but has anybody else combined more than one game into a single box for not just temporary, but actually for long term storage? And if so, post on the guild. And and how have you done it? Um, you know, have you done crazy ideas like like I have, or have you just relied on your memory to um, to, to remember which game is in is in one box? So definitely interested in uh, in hearing that. Competition time. Now another thing that I'd like you to do, Matt, yep. since you're here, is I ran a competition last time. Uh, which was to win £25 worth of game vouchers from Games Law uh, in the UK, sponsors of right. the podcast. And you had to basically reply on my YouTube channel with what you would do with the £25 and <laughs> also on my BGG guild. So I've spent a bit of time this afternoon going through every single entry. Uh, right. I've got them here. There are 67 of them. So I've got them all in front of me in an Excel right. spreadsheet. Um, if you could pick, and I've randomly sorted them. So if you mm-hmm. just pick a, a number from 1 to 67, oh, and then okay. we, will have, we will have a winner. Okay. We'll see if it's somebody I know, because the last podcast, it was somebody that I know. <laughs> but I mean, that, that, that's just one of the things. Friends of mine who listen to this podcast enter the competition. 
So Why they've got they, just right? as much yeah. chance of winning as everybody else. But then, of course, when I read out their name and it's the guy who lives, you know, four doors down, people think, wait a minute, but, you know. That's the way it goes, and it's much more convenient for you, I'm sure. Uh, yes. <laughs> just walk, <laughs> walk it around. Um, so. Well, we're podcast 44, right? So uh, we are podcast 44. Number 44. Number 44, right. Scroll down, scroll down. 44 is Simon Roadhouse. Uh, so I will let Simon know. Now, Simon said, glad that you're back, Paul. Enjoyed the new format. He would put the voucher towards Plague Inc., the board game. Oh, um, Have you played it? I have. It's one I reviewed not too long ago. Right. I'll actually. need to read that review then because I've heard good things about it. but it's didn't. Very, yeah, it's quite a clever implementation because you know, it's right. based on an app game. It's quite interesting how they've transferred it from like a single player versus the computer system into a board game that multiple people can play. That's it. He says both him and his wife have been loving the app and mm. he's, he's wanting to get the board game. So hopefully Simon's going to the UK Games Expo and I will arrange for him to be able to collect that from Games Law um, at the show. Now, I want to run another, another uh, quiz. Quiz? Contest? Yeah, not a mm -hmm. quiz. Another contest for this episode as well. Now, this is to win a copy of Handful of Stars. This is uh, Martin's last game that he's publishing under his Tree Frog Games uh, publishing house. Martin is still designing games and they are being published by other uh, publishers. And you can win a copy of Handful of Stars um, thanks to Games Law. Games Law are providing me with a copy of it. And again, what you need to do is go on to the YouTube channel or the guild on BGG and tell us what is your favourite Martin Wallace game and why. Now Martin's done a lot of different games over the years and he's done some ones which are up there in the mm. you know very, very most popular games. But not everybody likes Brass. No. Um, <laughs> you know, I, and he you know, for some people I'm sure Brass is gonna be their favourite Martin Wallace game because it yeah. is extremely clever, extremely good game. Uh, it's not my favourite Martin Wallace game, for example. So if I'm entering the contest, maybe I should. Um, I would definitely pick a different one. But because Martin has done so many different types of games, uh, I think it's a good question because I'm I'm actually interested. I in... was I was looking through his list of titles, and yeah. it's an imp yeah, it's a crazy mix. It is really broad yeah. selection of stuff. So that's that's the uh, that's the contest for uh, podcast number forty four. Go onto the YouTube channel or on the BGG Guild and tell us what is your favourite Martin Wallace game and why. And again, I will pick out a random winner next time and they will win a copy of A Handful of Stars. Um, and that's pretty much it. So, um, as I mentioned at the start, unfortunately there is no interview with Matt Leacock in this episode. I'm going to be recording that this coming Friday uh, and I'll probably put that out as a separate podcast on its own. Um, but yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming on the show, Matt. Well, thank you very much for having me, Paul. In the meantime, if people want to get hold of you, you are, what, the website we mentioned is creakingshelves.com. That's right. And you're on social media? I am on Twitter as at creakingshelf, because creaking shelves doesn't fit into the username size. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but if you search creaking shelves on Twitter, you'll find me. Uh, likewise, I'm on um, BGG under Creaking Shelves and on Instagram uh, at Creaking Shelf again. So that's everything for Podcast 44. Hope you've enjoyed it and join us for Podcast 45, which will just be the interview between me and Matt Leacock. Then on Podcast 46, which will be going out the week before the UK Games Expo, well, probably the week of the UK Games Expo, I'll be interviewing uh, the Polyhedron Collider team and finding out what they're looking forward to at the UK Games Expo. So yes, I appreciate any engagement on the Guild or over on the YouTube comments. And until next time, thanks very much for listening.